Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the High Point Museum on behalf of the High Point Historical Society. And um, we're going to have a really great speaker today. I'm proud to call Glenn one of my friends, and he has written lots of information about High Point, and he captures all aspects of High Point history, which is what makes him so special. I do have to plug something for the um, Historical Society. Next month, we're taking a trip to Raleigh, a bus trip to Raleigh, to see the furniture exhibit. And the North Carolina Museum is getting ready to close for two years, so this may be the last time for a while you can visit the Historical Museum. We're also going to take a trip to the North Carolina Archives while we're down there, which is such an interesting place to visit. So we'll be happy to give you information about that if you'd like to. But I'd really like to welcome Glenn today. Like I said, Glenn has such knowledge about High Point's history. Um, he's such a valuable asset to our community. So I'd like to welcome Glenn this morning. A bribe, a bribe. Those of you that have never met me, I love humor. I like to see people smile. And I try to make people smile every and laugh every day. If you're on my Facebook page, you will see the good, bad, and ugly about everything. But I, it's there to help people understand the things that really anger us. They're designed to anger us, all right? Um, first, I want to say something about Susie. Susie was a school teacher out at Parkview. And they used to have a good uh, Black History Month program. But I went to Susie's class, <laughs> and every, every year after that, she wouldn't, well, she was we were supposed to rotate. You come in here and you talk, she wouldn't let me out of the room. She said, uh -uh, my kids don't learn about history. <laughs> yeah, people are talking about how to cook this, that, and all these other things. But uh, once again, Glenn Romero Chavis, born December 3rd, 1940. That makes me 27 years old. If you do the math correctly. Uh, in High Point, down on Lundy Hill Avenue, uh, at my grandparents' home. Um, I love High Point. I love High Point. And I've learned to love it even more because I know the good, bad, and ugly. If we live in a society where people are always pointing their fingers, but they don't have any documentation to prove anything. Let me give an example. I'm not still one about it. Uh, they went downtown, they walked downtown, the kids that sat down at the counter at Woolworths. Somebody called me up, I want to know why you weren't there. Didn't you go to William Penn? And anybody knows me, they oh, you got me ready to go. I let her finish, and I let into her. Tell me some history of William Penn, young lady. What do you know about William Penn? Why are you holding it in such high esteem when you know nothing about it? Yes, I was there, and I got put out. I got married my senior, uh, end of my junior year. My wife and I were with child, and then you couldn't then you couldn't go to William Penn High School. I don't know about Central, but they had this rule: someone was pregnant. First, the girls, the girls had, and Miss Huge, Alpha J. Griffin, and was uh, uh You made me dean of women. Now they both going home. So I had to leave. Mr. Samuel Burford, Samuel Eugene, Eugene, Eugene Burford. Mr. Burford, all oh, these teachers and stuff would always be Mr. and Mrs. to me. That's the way I was raised. But Mr. Burford called in his office. 10.30 that morning, I turned my books in. At 2 o'clock, he came to my house and he told my parents, I am not going to have a National Honor Society, Crown and Scepter Club, Beta Club student working in the factory. He said, we got to do something. <coughs> he put me in his car and took me to Greensboro and got me in a school called Emanuel Lutheran Junior College. It was a boarding school for blacks. Right there at the end of A&T's campus. They, bought, they eventually bought it. It's down about a tennis court. 
Now, that was a scary experience for me. I had never had a white instructor in my life. And all of a sudden, I got these old Germans that were straight. I mean, they didn't play, and I had to learn something called catechism. From page one all the way through there. And I'm going like, oh, man. But I made straight A's. And when the man had graduated, he said, this young man first got the president of the school, Dr. Camp Smith. He said, first time I've ever given an A to a student in catechism. He told me why? Because he was scared of me. I was scared of every man. I mean, I mean, he, when he opened his mouth, he was scared. But I learned something. Now, what do you do after you graduate from high school? By the I got my child's born. We stand with my mother, father. Mr. Burford said, "Look, he's going to college. Put me in college. A uh, car took me to." Charlotte, North Carolina, and got me in Johnson C. Smith University. There I washed dishes, cleaned classrooms. I was there on the work aid. The point I'm trying to make, my community saw more in me than I was seeing in myself. They uplifted me. They would not let me fall. And when I'm talking to students in school, I tell them, you'll be surprised at the people that, and how they're looking at you. I was out at Parkview. I, I was telling the students, these teachers suffer through pain that you will never recognize and, get, and don't get paid enough for it. By, I mean, it's out of outrageous. That's another story. But... Um, if we cannot find teachers that teach our black history, we're never going to learn it. <coughs> I don't know who this, I can't remember this quote now. I'm 83 years old, I admit that. So I, I forget a lot of things. But uh, it's, it went like this. If we share each other's stories, we learn so much toward the future. If we just sit down and discuss it, but we, most of us don't have anything to discuss because we have not done due diligence. I'm getting, now I'm getting on my people. Okay? If you're going to start my history with some students sitting down in 1960, we're never going to get anywhere. If you're going to start my history talking about Martin Luther King, we're never going to get anywhere. The media fools us every year. They put their stuff out there and, oh, look what they're doing. Black History Month. TCC, TCT last week had something on, oh, can't remember the man's name, discovered blood plasma. Transfusion. Charles Drew. Charles Drew. Yes. And guess what it was dated? Two years ago. Just going there, pulling out something, putting it out, putting it up there. My history is more important than that. Okay, I. Um, does anyone? Oh, I saw my uh, William Penn High School. You should know if you're going to brag about that school, and I brag about it, and the teachers know something about it. Why was it first created? Does anybody have any idea? At the original name now, remember before William Penn, it was High Point Normal and the Industrial Institute. So anybody have any idea? Because what we see now is, I just found out last year, that it's incorrect. It was actually not 1892, but 1890. And I found that in the um, uh, city, city directory. They were advertising. And it was for girls. This was a school for girls. Training young girls. And somebody recently told me they didn't know. They thought that just kids from High Point. Kids came all over North Carolina. Just like that school I went to in Greensboro. They came here to attend High Point Normal and Industrial. Say kids with money. Let me put it like that, because when I went to uh, 
Lutheran, all those kids that follow the doctors, lawyers, you name it, you get away like for the, go to school and then come home during the summer and then we'll send you back. That type of thing. When I, um, oh, and I, I, somebody said, I thought you were going to be casual. <laughs> but 32 years I wore, I had to wear suits, sport coats. I got, I love it. I got, I got stuff and uh, I guess the moths are just waiting for me <laughs> to turn my back. Then they're going to give up everything. But I love Brooks Brothers. I like five or $600 sport coats and stuff. That was me. That's what I worked for. Okay. And it's all sitting there in the closet because I'm retired. So I say, no, my wife said, I thought you were going to be casual. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when I retired, I started doing a family genealogy. And it was very interesting. But all of a sudden, I had to go look at other records or seek other references to document. I'm a facts person. Don't say anything to me or argue with me unless you got facts. Don't tell me who said what. We got enough of that in the community now. Okay. Now, I start saying, let me just move over here for a while and look at this. My best source has been city council records. That's when you get the good, bad, and ugly of our happening. That's when you find out that in 1915, High Point decided to pass an ordinance forbidding colored inhabitants, not citizens, but inhabitants from certain sections of the city. As a result of that, Four distinct black communities were created. You got the east side, south side, uh, Macedonia, and you had about two streets out there on the east end. Oh, it's about 1925. Somebody got upset because blacks and whites were eating in the same cafes. They, they were cafes then, not rest, restaurants. Cafes. Claude Halsey was in sanitation office. Oh, you can tell him was racist reading his comments before council. But he objected to that. And he convinced them they needed to do something. He, he said they're serving each uh, blacks and whites out of the same kitchen in the same dining room. Council said, you go back and you tell them if they don't change their ways, we're not going to renew their license. Two months later, Claude went back, according to the council records now, and told them, I talked to, I talked to them, but some still doing the same thing. They passed an ordinance saying that you could serve coloreds and whites out of the same building, but there had to be a petition between the races. Nice wording. Then, but you also had to have a new steam cleaner. <laughs> they come out with these new steam cleaners of addition. I've heard that, you know, a lot of people couldn't afford that. So, let's go back to High Point Normal and industrial in terms of education. And I admire the Quakers. Uh, I went to a Quaker Trade, Deep River for about six, about six years and uh, enjoyed every bit of it. But we would never have gotten an education in the city of High Point had it not been for the Quakers. They founded that the city, the city had a contract with the Quakers. They didn't want to have anything to do with educating colored kids. So they had a contract. <coughs> And the Quaker, the city gave money to the Quakers to do the job. Well, I think it was around 1923. The city was trying to do something, and the state of North Carolina told them, oh, wait a minute, hold it. No, no, no. 
you're going to educate. You're not going to sign a contract with the Quakers. You're going to do it yourself. Or you're getting, you aren't going to get any money. So, the, the save our behinds <laughs> here in High Point and our so-called leaders, the Quakers donated the property to the city of High Point. And it was around 27, 28, that area, uh, era that they changed the name to William Penn High School in honor of uh, the Quakers and William Penn. Uh, that's how it got its name. My stories um, about the good, bad, and ugly. All the things I've been getting, like Gail staying back there, she cried on some, she laughed on others. <laughs> That's uh, Principal Hudson's uh, daughter. Uh, he was here in High Point as a principal at one of the schools and lived across from us on Underhill. Underhill was like uh, what up in Emerywood. They used to call it uh, uh, Black Emerywood. Okay. Nobody can remember this but me, but there used to be two pillars on each side of the street and there was like a Arc, half an arc going over, and it said, Welcome to Underhill. One day it just disappeared. <laughs> Everything, a lot of things disappeared in our community. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting on the city to tell me what happened to the train at Washington Terrace Park. The city didn't buy that train. My daddy's club, the Patrician Club, bought that train from Thomasville, had a remote, named it the Patrician Special. But all of a sudden, it disappeared one day. I've been asking and asking. Nobody knows. So it's and and not only that, the city all the city had to do was grade an area off, and they paid for everything. It's like an agreement. I think I talked to my father. He was a member of the club. Like a ten-year agreement, and then you would take over, and you make the money. And um, well, let's get back to let's talk about Washington Street. Everybody loves Washington Street, but let's not get Fairview Street. That was in another black community. Okay, they were flourishing on that side, but they really wanted to enjoy themselves. They had to come to this side. This is like I told some students out at Parkview um, last week. I said. All you all came here this morning on that big yellow bus. I said, they pick you up out there, brought you here, opened the door, and you got, you got back on it. Guess what? Kids from Fairview Street had to walk all the way over here, rain, shine, sleet, or snow. And you gonna complain? As you tell your parents, call me on the phone. And I said, tell them I said it. <laughs> yes. I was my little, uh, little those little rubber coats, uh, outfits, the uh, yellow and, and, and the boots and everything. Six years old, out right there going to Little Street School. They even had, I was a crossing guard. You put a kid out there, now they kill him. <laughs> put your little white sands and belt on. But those are the things I'm writing about. Those are the things that made my community enjoyable things that I'm proud of, but you don't know about it unless you live there. Do I want to criticize the enterprise? Well, we leave the surprise alone today. And I think it does a good job itself. But had it not been for the enterprise, I wouldn't know, say, 75% of the stuff that I know now about High Point, because they used to have something called news of interest to colored people. And it started back in the 30s. And it was nice, you know, who, who was born, where, and uh, organizations. All you had to do was look at that particular column. And it was started by a preacher's wife on the south side. She brought it up. It's okay, you put something together, and we got it. <clears throat> but then, you know, some people didn't like it, but it went, well, everything started changing in the 60s, and all of a sudden, you know, it left the newspaper. It was an embarrassment. I didn't find it embarrassing, I found it educational. <coughs> we don't seem to know when we 
are being educated regarding our history. And when I say our history, folks, well, I'm here today to talk about black history, all right? But it goes for anything, really. Let's say the exhibit downstairs, the Ebony and Jet magazine exhibit. Fantastic. Guess what? When I walked in the door, you know what I saw? I didn't see magazines. I saw history. History, history, history. I was standing in this grinning about to wait. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I was so excited. But this history right there. And I, I posted something the other day. I said, when you go over there, get your pen and a piece of paper and write some things down and go home and research it. If we just learn one new thing <coughs> every February, <laughs> Once a year now, just one thing that we could share, rather the same old things, over and over. Because, you give it to Martin Luther King. Have you ever heard Martin Luther King, oh no, have you ever heard a white speaker speak and not mention Martin Luther King? No, if I had you found one, call me on the phone. <laughs> They're going to always have to quote Martin Luther King. Because it makes us feel like, oh, you one of us, you would just enjoy us to death. <laughs> I laugh about that all the time. It happens. Come on, I remember, uh, oh, well, to be honest with you, I was a Malcolm X person. I understood what he was doing. And uh, I was in college, down at John C. Smith. The fools talked me into going downtown, no, you know how radical I was, You're going down for something peaceful. Now, I agreed, and I go down to Woolworths, and I stand there in front of a tussie deodorant. Anybody remember tussie deodorant? A white ball with that pink top, big glass. This man walks up to me, and I knew what he was going to have to do. I grabbed a bottle of dirt and I hit him, blood flew everywhere. <laughs> they ushered me out of the side door on Trade Street, took me back to camp and told me, you embarrassed us. It's nonviolent. I said, you knew about me before you did that. <laughs> what were you expecting with violence? If somebody created, I was going to be a part of it. <laughs> but let's get back to it. You know, when you have when you have so much in your community, it wasn't a large community, and all of a sudden, somebody says, you're free at last, free at last, great God Almighty, you're free at last, that was in the 60s. What did you do? This is what I'm getting on my people now. What did you do? Let's take it Washington Street. We could not wait to get a walk across Washington Street and get a white doctor, a white dentist, a white anything, a white theater, go to the white theater. And what happened? It went downhill. But we want to blame the city of High Point and everybody else for what we were responsible for. We didn't, that didn't have to happen. It did not have to happen. A street that had three black hotels on it, you can't find that across the nation. Can anybody tell me the first black hotel on Washington Street? Knew it. Wait on that one. That's wrong, don't worry about it. <laughs> no, it was a hidden hotel. Yeah. Down on Main Street, with his R. Hinton at a restaurant down there. And High Point was growing. All these different industries come to High Point. People up north, white national, they want to be part of it. So they came down here and they, were, they forced him down on Washington Street. Which is the best thing ever happened. Because he opened a 14 room hotel right there by the First Baptist Church in that area. New Women Hotel. This is one of my books, by the way. Uh, you're going to see a picture of uh, he and his family sitting out in front of the little fur capes on and everything. He couldn't read. 
all right, she could read. Thank God they had some good attorneys that had to have some good lawyers that didn't take advantage of them because they bought land and stuff. And, uh, oh, and these things as they come to me. I remember my friends would come to high point or relatives for the first time and they would say, um, we're going somewhere, we're going on the south side or whatever. They're on the bus. And they hop on the bus and they go to the back. What do you know about that? Come on. Don't you have it? No, not on this bus. <laughs> this bus is called City Transit. A white man came over here from Winston-Salem, got a contract, went for the council to operate City Transit, and they ran in the black community only. <clears throat> from the east side to the south side, all day long. And they even stopped in front of your house if you lived on the route. In my community. Now, if you want to do power, do power in north south. You were crazy, what are you going to do? Unless you want to work in the Inglewood. If you don't know what you're demonstrating for, or what's coming out of your mouth, period, about something, keep closed. You've heard of Al Campbell? Okay. <laughs> I step on your guys, tell them, don't worry about that. <laughs> but no, things need to be corrected. And it's very hard. I make mistakes. Thank God I have a museum that catches them. Uh, but Al claimed to be the first black fireman. And I mean, it's spread. We, I still have people today that believe that. But he wasn't. Okay? Think. Paul Steed and Al Campbell, Paul Steed was in my class, were in the same training class. The day of the swearing in, Al had something to take care of. He didn't show up. So they swore him in. Week later, got to make you second? Right. But Al, that, he used that. He used that to his advantage. He never corrected anyone. Our first black doctor. Who was it? Not Tillman. See? That was, you know, she knows me. <laughs> <laughs> but they would say Otis Tillman. Otis Tillman. Otis Tillman. Otis came here in 19, around 1954. Our first black doctor was here in about the 1890s. Toward the end, right at the very end of the verse. Yeah. These are the type of things that have been spread false history that we've been, we can't teach something until we correct it and get it right. Uh, Strip Boyd to the city manager, uh, I was out of the city council meeting and they hadn't put me out yet, so <laughs> uh, usually that's what happened. And so um, Strip came to me and he had picked up a uh, what would you call this? Either like a fly, not a flyer, but uh, for, you know how you fold things over, a trifle over something? Yeah, sure. trifle, okay. And um, he said it was uh, about black history in Durham, North Carolina. He had done that for a meeting. He said, Glenn, can we do anything like this? I said, let me look it over. And uh, about two weeks later, got to get on the strip. And then was the money problem. Oh, well, we've got to get somebody with some money. So he said, we'll take care of that. Got the money. And we put them out there. Uh, I think we had, we had four. We had four. Now it's not in print. Now, let me tell you how, how we are. The first one I remember was working with the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we got down to finalizing on who we're going to put in there. And I said, now let me tell you all, I don't deal with Nanny Kilby. I don't deal with um, the latest Rosetta Baldwin and John Coltrane. I said, too many exaggerations, too much false information or whatever. I, don't, I can't prove or disprove it, I stay away from it. Okay, so they put it out. And uh, this young lady over here called Miss Edith Brady called me over the phone laughing. 
have you seen, have you seen the new brochure? <laughs> I said, no, she said, you, you look at it. Well, what she caught was John Coltrane. <laughs> no, no, I told the guy to leave that out. Oh, no, 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 he's going to call his favorite person in the community. You wouldn't know what that means. No more than anybody else, you know. And then he told me about this. Well, this beats the Bible. It really does. She died about four years before. It said that John Coltrane used to sit on the back steps and, and uh, used to do his work. And when he wasn't working, he would sit on the back steps and practice his saxophone. Now, she died four years before he was born. <laughs> That's what you call a miraculous birth. <laughs> right there in this brochure that people could see and believe. And they spread like wildfire. And then we came up with the thing, they want to add all these people to Look at the people that you want in something I like dead people. They can't embarrass you. <laughs> okay, that's why I, that was when they called me into the meeting, I said, they have to be dead. That's all I have to say. <laughs> and sure enough, Fantasia hit the fan about six months after that, because they had her name on it. Her time had come probably, but I was looking for something that we could use here at the museum, schools, churches, whatever, to show you how 25 or 30 people change high point. As I said, I'm old. When I wanted to go to the movie, Paramount, the Rialto, Cinema uh, Theater, they were all segregated. We couldn't go to those movies. Uh, well, the Paramount, I uh, know for the Paramount, uh, you had a balcony. That was the craziest thing in the world. Why would you put me on top of you? Because <laughs> as soon as you made me mad, you know I'm going to throw something over there. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but uh, I remember walking to Southside. I was courting some young lady on the court on Southside. And I was coming back by myself. And uh, I went over to the colored window and uh, was putting my money in. This guy said, hey, hey, come on over here. I look, folks, uh, y'all talking about the N-word. Come on over here and get away from that nigga window. Now, I use the word, but you probably get killed using it. But let me explain something to you. I have read thousands and thousands of pages of documents, and I've only seen the word nigger used one time. It was by a black man, mm -hmm. our first black teacher. What is it, Thomas Dye? Okay. Now, I'll tell you what bothering word bothers me? Nigger and niggers. I don't use those, because that's what you're going to see when you research it. You're going to see those two terms. Uh, but our theater, why what, what did I need to go downtown? A man came over from Greensboro, I think it was 1939, and for $10,000 he built, and this year stayed, the old Ritz Theater on Washington Street. They built that for right, because it's still standing. You notice there's a church up there, First Baptist Church, it was leaning in the ministry had to be torn down. They hired a, a jack leg to do some work in the church and the fool took out a, a support beam. So over the years it started leaning and leaning. Finally. But um, on the other hotel we got the Kilby, the Hinton, and the third one was the uh, Henley. Henley Hotel, that was on the corner of Washington and Underhill. Okay, J.C., uh, yeah, J.C. Henley, Mr. Henley, uh, John Kelly, Henley uh, ran that. And the baseball teams, the black baseball teams like the Newark Braves or whatever, when they 
So a spring trainer, they would come down, and they would stay at the hotels. And uh, eventually, uh, when things got started modernizing, whatever, it was just a, actually, there was only one floor because they had a dry cleaners, a grocery store, and a beauty shop downstairs. So, I mean, why are we running from this community and we have all these things? Grocery stores, pharmacies, but I always wondered if somebody doesn't want me and I go to them for a medical problem, oh, what are they happen to me? I was in 32 years of pharmaceutical sales and I know you can give somebody something very simple and give them over a period of time. Being mis purposely misdiagnosed. That's what hate will do to people. And it's sad. It is really sad. Um, the, oh, uh, on Washington Street at one time, we had two putt-putt golf courses. Old man Kester, old Kester Furniture. He came over that Washington Street uh, golf course, right there across, um, across from the Kilby on that side of the street right there. It used to be a big lot. Yes. And then you go down and you go across what we call the Kilby Drive Bridge. We'll take you down Kilby Drive on the left there. That was one called Shady Oaks golf course down on Hobson Street, right there on the corner there, it's a fish market where this closed now. Used to have to sell fish. Right. There used to be a skating rink. These white people coming in, creating these for us. A skating rink. Which, I mean, the type, you know, you put the shoes on, you had the bank, wooden track and stuff. Lightning struck it twice and the man had to back up and leave. <laughs> you know, but it was, when we were mad at him because we wanted to wear our J.C. Higgins and all the other things. And let's not forget Daniel Brooks. Daniel Brooks was put there for a reason, to help. And that's exactly what it did. And the price of living there. But it was unlike this stuff out there now. Right now I see a bunch of lazy tenants doing nothing. Now, let me tell you about it. When you live down in Winston, Flo had it. You cut your own grass. You ain't waiting nobody to come down through there cutting grass. You went to the administration building, you signed out a lawnmower, those push mowers. That's where we made our money. You know, for the nickel, we'll cut your grass. You had to paint your own partner. Every so many years, you had to go to the office and get the number of gallons of paint based on the size of your partner. I lived there for a year, my mother and father. A pipe burst, my father was in the Navy, he wasn't up in Norfolk. My mother said, I'm not going back there. <laughs> so she uh, moved over to my uh, grandparents. But I did not know that that was federally funded housing until I was grown. It was so well kept. They had their own recreation facility. That's where I spent my day from, right across the street. I lived on the corner of Normal and West, and there it was right across the street. I went over there and they had the water spraying up in the air, and they had baseball, basketball, and they had a recreation center. That's where we smooched with our little girlfriends on, you know, hugging and kissing and rubbing and carrying on. <laughs> but that was it. I mean, we didn't have to do anything. It was right there for us. But then there was the park. We can go to City Lake Park, right? Okay. So, to shut us up, they built a park out there. I have an original drawing, architectural drawing of that. You should see the things we had. Some I remember. I remember where that community center is now that there used to be a brick facility there and the middle of it was out. But on each end they had a fireplace 
Oh, uh, much longer. They a little longer than that table. Big old fireplace. Big angle lines. Uh, those things you put your wood and stuff on. When they had a pic picnic back then, they cook a half a steer, a pig. That was their idea of picnicking. 28 <coughs> Christian acres of land. And we had shuffleboard, basketball, football, baseball, all these things. But what happened? The integration. The integration. When someone tells you you're not, you're not wanted, inquisitive. What do they have out there? They don't want me to enjoy. So when they integrated, what did we do? We took our family reunions and all their picnics and all that, and we went to City Lake. Not realizing that money follows people. If you got a thousand people going to Washington Terrace, and you got ten thousand going to City Lake, that's where the money's going. But now if we have these family reunions, and our classes come back. Hey, they are at the park, regardless. And um, let me just let you all ask questions. I can talk all day. You in for it? <laughs> I'll sit down for some lunch, and you know we all get there and talk. But no, any questions of uh, something I want you want me to cover? Can you talk about the red brick building that was on the corner? Oh, the one they just tore down? Yeah. Okay. What was that, in there? Uh, Glenn, can you repeat the question? 400. Can you repeat the question? J just repeat it so everyone hears it. Oh, she wants to know about the, on the corner of Centennial in Washington, there was a red brick building and recently, uh, and I just remembered something about that building. When we moved back home 40 something years ago, my wife and I, Dallas Furniture Company was downstairs there. Of course, we went in there and bought some of these uh, copper pots and so forth. And uh, you know, Dallas had it was a big operation. But uh, downstairs, you all, oh, man, what's the man's name? Um, he prepared. He repaired uh, bicycles. He started a place there, and then the team on Ford came out. And he started working on those. Ganaway, Ganaway. Ganaway didn't play. Uh, and uh, he got into it with uh, the city of Highport about something. So he moved to Trinity. And he's some down there called Ganaway Park. And then we used to go down there and party. Down at Ganaway Park. But he also sued, uh, he, he was too far away from the south side and, and this side for his kids to go to school. So he challenged it in court. And they had to create the Danaway Children's District. <laughs> and he got his way. Danaway had money. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that money, I left some of the uh, uh, morticians uh, how people used to pay, you know, so a lot of people didn't have money. So you bake a cake or ham or, you know, take it in there and you give it to them, you know. And that was acceptable because, you know, everybody was in the same boat regardless. Most of our teachers lived on Underhill of Washington Street. Most of our pastors were right there. We knew everybody. Everybody looked out for everybody. Now we don't know people. We don't know each other. I've got a whole thick thing full of clubs and organizations. We don't have those. We got Delta Sigma Theta, Alpha. That's uh, my solo. Not my solo, AKA. <laughs> but yes, but uh, we had so many clubs and organizations and believers. I mean, we, churches, now the church back then was very powerful, not like it is now. I mean, they had power. They came together as one. And they voiced it. Right? Um, let me tell you about something that don't happen, I'm going to shut up. 
on Washington Street once. There was a movie theater, 4th and uh, Washington Street. There was a movie the theater there. And, uh, but, well, you know where the um, city building is right there, the old front library, our last library? Okay. Well, matter of fact, that used to be a tennis court. Ossie Davis, he liked to play tennis. And he didn't want to go to Greensboro and went to Santa play tennis. So what did he do? He, the uh, High Point Tennis Club, and uh, he had it graded, paid, and uh, started his club, and they played tennis. And they want to compete against each other with other teams. He had lights put up, okay? Uh, but there used to be a movie theater right up there, uh, going up toward the College Avis Y, and the uh, Bamberg Proud Bethune YMCA. Oh, proud of that. Because I'm about me. Carl Chambers uh, YMCA, that's my father's brother. I'm proud of that. About the one in the family wasn't bootlegging and all the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's why my family's from up in the mountains, you know. And the, the mountain girl back there. <laughs> but uh, that's what, you know, they had steels up there. And, uh, I often wonder why my father wanted to visit so much. <laughs> Go up there and get tuned up, you know. <laughs> what the guy said, you, if you ever ran out of gas, all you had to do was stop and get a fucking half gallon of moonshine up in there. That thing running in New York. <laughs> Just so, Claire, we don't know what happened to the archway at the entrance Nobody. of the building in Washington. I'm going to put you person who remembers the whole thing. Uh, so many things uh, disappeared. Uh, there was a medallion on that hill up there, right in front of William Penn when you turn into the parking lot, and it's uh, about the highest point on the uh, Southern Railroad's route. I used to see it, but now nobody can find it. Um, things just disappear, and uh, all the fun stuff. Another thing about Boone, uh, these are the stories that I've written about. You know, you had to, Country Club, High Point Country Club. Okay. Awesome. That's money. That was money. But black men, when they got out of work, they went to something called bootlegging houses. Okay? That's where they socialized and played big whist. You know, had some drink, and laughed and talked. That was what we were doing. Because it certainly wasn't getting the membership out there at the club. <laughs> so, but this is, I hope you're taking this like I do, as I say, it's the good, bad, and ugly. And I've learned to laugh because I can use that laughter to educate people. You say, like, that could not possibly have happened. And I told you how I am, I have my facts. When do you want to meet? We'll go over yours, we'll go over mine. <laughs> I never hear from them yet. I moved to High Point in high school, and I lived on the South Side. And we used to catch the bus to William Penn, but I always tried to figure out why we paid to ride the bus. We could walk, but um, why we paid to ride the bus to William Penn back and forth. And if it was public, you know, public education. Well, then you see the transit, what you are, you see, that red, uh, burgundy, and gray bus. Yeah, yes. um, uh, we, we were paying. We I can't, you know, I don't, I don't even remember when they started buses in the black neighborhood, you know, other than city transit. I never, uh, well, I think it started with Griffin, when Griffin was built. Oh, and I was in the first graduating, I'm proud of that, from uh, Griffin, seventh grade. Boy, that was a new adventure, you know, uh, and, but, Folks, you, when you believe in something, you have to get behind it. Now, you notice now the, the big thing is city. Look what we are doing to Washington Street. Yeah. Well, your behind should have been doing it 15 years ago when I brought it to your attention. <laughs> when I took you up there and I showed you the erosion over there when it was like this, then I take a new one back while it was the first one. My dog, I took him over there and said, look, it was like this. 
and our most precious possession going in there every day on the, I don't know how much it was his way. It could have crashed at any time. But yet and still now they want to brag about a $20 hamburger and a $10 beer. You need to be worried about our kids. I'm going to something tomorrow night out at uh, Park View. Uh, trying to get a red light out there. You're putting your life at stake on Gordon Road and you're trying to get out. Because who's flying down the street? But Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, I, they, are there any troops in High Point anymore? I have never heard of one of my community in the last 10 years at least say anything about girls. That used to be the big thing. The big thing. Even though we were separated, a couple times they put us together. I know one time. Down in Salisbury, black and white. <laughs> when we weren't staying together. But sometimes stuff just comes over in the middle of the night. <laughs> Yeah, why did they put us down here and they up there? So let's go up here and, and visit them in the middle of the night. <laughs> oh, but, uh, and that's in my book. Uh, we had a, a special Boy Scout leader at that time. Man couldn't swim at all. I'm going to teach somebody about swimming. But, um, oh, I need to shut up. Um, but uh, if you ever have questions, the museum knows how to reach me. I, this is my Disney world. <laughs> I love the museum. And um, it, it's beyond me when I talk to people. Museum, which museum? How many do you have in my point? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this exposing themselves to ignorance. Here's where, and I tell my, oh, Please tell me, black in here, tell you, share your artifacts with the museum. Don't put them in the closet because the house may burn down. <laughs> Anything can happen. This is where they protect it, and they keep it, and they share it. If you visit them on land, then you see pieces of all the things that we have collected. Unbelievable. And it doesn't cost anything. I charge you to come in here. I bet you you're not charging a dollar and they start coming in here. And then they have something to complain about. I paid a dollar to go in there. <laughs> but uh, no, we need to support. It. Because Sister Annie, the secretary of the church, when she died, uh, young, what's the guy's name? It's right. He said, Glenn, he used to share a lot of history with me that he found on the road. He said, why is it that when somebody black dies, the first thing they do is go in there with a plastic bag and they just start throwing stuff and they take it out the street. He said, I come along, I pick it up, take it home, and there's all this history. And he gave me a lot of things that I, I usually write about something, then I share it, I donate it to the museum. And I donate if someone calls me about something, I will bring it over to but I want it in the person's name or the family name because it's not mad. It's their history that they're sharing. Glenn, I used to think when I would see um, in Facebook or where you're putting it, your information out, a lot of your facts would be 1800, 1820. I said to my husband, why is he talking about what happened a long time ago? <laughs> Everything else, we all know what happened. Many years, what the 60s and 70s, we don't know our story from back then. So I applaud you for keeping that history way back hundreds of years ago, maybe not that long, but maybe so. Keeping it alive and well and keeping it in front of society because my black history is American history. That I just wanted to say that I applaud you. Continue to do it. This is a uh what they was talking about, this, well, you can see, me. I use it for researching. This is my first book that I put out. And it says like uh, August 34th, uh, what was this, 1934, a uh, tennis match between whoever, whatever. Um, but all of these are quick things 
that happened on that particular date. Okay? Now, because I believe in fact, I love Roots. Roots was a great book. It still is a great book. But I don't know what Chicken Man said. <laughs> but he got something in there. What Chicken Man said? That's not factual to me. Um, that's what this book is all about. So it starts in, um, what is it, 19? No, I'm just, this one just hit me because this one is an ugly one. Have you been out to Oakwood Cemetery, Cemetery out yes. of Martin? Yes. Okay. In our history, years ago, uh, they have a Confederate uh, section where they buried the Confederate soldiers. Do you know that in ninth, the 1900s, what was it, like 18 something? It's in my book, by the book. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, someone, what was his name, went before representing uh, a group and asked that two, confer uh, two black souls be moved that were too close to the Confederate memorial. Oh. And do you know they dug them up mm -hmm. and moved them and there's no record. Mm -hmm. We don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. It's that they disappeared over there. Mm -hmm. And that once again came out of City Council records. Mm -hmm. And it's probably, I think it's on page, first page in here. And my second book, this book, uh, this one I just had to do. This is uh, about our black schools, okay? Uh, from, uh, I think, 18, 1890 up until 1968. What I did, I have something on uh, just about every graduating class that I can find. Uh, who graduated, teachers' names, where they live, uh, salaries, okay? Um, you see, and you, I mean, you're like, oh my gracious, you know, when you have, uh, you have a principal, Ossie Davis, or a principal over at Fairview, city's paying $5 a month. Mm -hmm. The white principals are making 70 to $90 a month. But the Quakers stepped in and gave him uh, $25, making him $30 a month. Mm -hmm. That's in here. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk about that. I, I, I copied this. A lady got so mad in the city, I mean, she, uh, she liked my uh, columns that uh, the News and Record uh, used to publish, uh, print, rather. 334 columns that I did about us. And uh, that was one of them. You know, uh, how do you justify this? But people like you will sit and think, that's factual. That's a fact. I mean, this stuff made up, as I said, uh, and uh, Lord knows we're trying to correct it. Uh, so that's my second one. Oh, you do know about the new one, right? This is one you're going to buy today, right? <laughs> we take credit cards, checks. I will use in. Uh, <laughs> this is my new book. It's going to be a three volume set. But this is the first one. My high point in black and white with a dash of color. Okay. See that on the front? That picture on the front? I've been getting calls. Uh, Why did you put your picture on there? <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, I, uh, but that's my father when he was 14 years old. Mm -hmm my father. And uh, Nathan, what is he, our publisher, editor, editor, yeah. editor everything. <laughs> uh, he chose to do that. This lady here, she shared, she's on the back because she shared so much information with me. She had graduated from uh, Winston-Salem State, but she was there when they, it was, I can't what it's called, way back in time, and she was so impressed with what I was doing. But instead of uh, facts, now I've got stories. So there are hundred and something stories in each one. Uh, 
was our Hen Found's High Point's first black owned hotel. Uh, uh, you never knew what to eat at the chamber's table. I'd say, my family's from the mountains. <laughs> so if you saw something on the table with a red crab apple in his mouth, <laughs> grinning, you knew it was a possum. <laughs> and you started to cry that you were going to eat some of that possum. Uh, uh, this is my granny. Uh, this is about, uh, that's all the black women. My grandmother, uh, she get up in the morning, that fire, she go in the kitchen, fire that stove up, that wood in there, that big iron stove where you warm your biscuits up and you warm your water up on the side. And she had that apron. I don't care what happened during that day. That apron had a cure for it. <laughs> if you snagged your pants, she had a needle and three. <laughs> when the stove, she, she, black women, those aprons, I've learned to appreciate them. Uh, the, uh, the malt bar was down on, um, uh, no, no, this is uh, the Toot and Tail. There are very few people, the museum had this picture to share. The Avenue, right there by Underhill, and between Underhill and Elkhorn Street. The Saunders family. Uh, T.F. Sanders was the uh, first black attorney in High Point. And his family, he had his money, he was cheap. A uh, man, cheese and crackers in his pocket, stains. He never did change clothes, they said. And, uh, but he owned, matter of fact, that, uh, like the old Lexington Avenue, he owned that, those shoppers and those stuff. Like, they owned that land at one time. But uh, I, I, I never did understand this. A drive in, and we didn't even have cars. <laughs> <laughs> so you walk in one door and you get your hamburger, hot dog, and your soda, and you go out the other side, stand out there and clean. <laughs> but that was with the meeting place for following the band all the way down college, all the way out to uh, the stadium. That's where we played our games. Uh, football. We used to be out on uh, Burton Street. Uh, there's a baseball field out there, and they let blacks come out there and play football before they built this stadium out here. And uh, this is, I, I laugh when I go through these things myself. Uh, uh, our first black uh, architect, well, we call him an architect, but uh, actually he was, uh, what do they call it, uh, you do blueprints and so forth, Mr. Landry. Had a big studio on the back of his house, and uh, but oh, Bill. When you go into the schools, I guess you were still doing that, but I remember you did go into the public schools um, and talk about Black history, African American history, whatever. How are the students? Are they impressed? Are they just say, eh, so what? I mean, let me tell you what I'm up against. Oh, I love it. I have an invitation here today, <laughs> and, and you know what? I don't charge people. I just want to get the message out there, share the history. But uh, they will phrase that again. I'm trying to give you the best. When well, you talk about the history, maybe maybe Washington Street used yeah. to be the mecca. I mean, are they the like, students? Wow, I mean the no. students. Are they impressed or just? No, you have to. You try to break it down to their level. Yeah. Uh, and uh, like I was talking about going, going to school and riding the bus, and uh, I try to bring those things in. And then I can go up and talk about um, the golf course and uh, the roller skating down to uh, Daniel Brooks. You know, uh, uh, that one outfit that we had. Sunday outfit, boy, I never get, boy, I was playing and snagged it. Woo! Well, I thought they'd never stop beating on me. <laughs> but yeah, you took that, you went to church, came home, took it off, and you went out to play. I, I want to kind of comment on that. I taught school for 30 years in Guilford County, 25 at Park View. It's my heart. But I can honestly remember the first time we ever did this program, it was a big deal. I thought second grade, I thought it was a 
I think all history is important. But uh, Glenn, I don't know if you remember, I had parents, so many parents come and say, I, had, I grew up in high school, I didn't know any of this. There was so much history from, and of course, Parkview's right there at the park, or right at Washington, I mean, the Washington Terrace Park. They didn't know this information about their own town. That's right. Nobody had ever shared it. And I mean, I had so many parents and grandparents say that. And it just, I mean, it made me feel good that we were doing it, but I just, again, think you got you got to make an effort to make sure that you're telling everything and not yes, everybody does. And Susan's making a good point, because this is what happened to me on the Zoom program in the elementary school. And when I say them, no, I'm usually the only one, because I talk. And I'm going to run through as much as I can. So about 15 minutes into it, the lady says, the principal says, oh, uh, Mr. Chambers, we're going to have to stop you there. We have other people. I said, other people? <laughs> she said, yes, we have some other people. I said, talking about what? <laughs> Cooking soul food and, and braiding hair. That's when she cut me off because she had two people going to do that. That's all the stuff I'm up against. I, well, <laughs> believe me, I wish she, she wished she had put her hand on that button earlier because <laughs> I got totally upset. I didn't have to curse, her, but I talked about how ignorant you can be standing in front of these te uh, uh, students teaching them something that they don't get at home anyway. They can see their friends do it. But is that history? Now, the history of can you prove or can you really give those students a lecture on hair? Starting back from the voyage over to America? Now that would be doing something. But not putting some royal crown on your hair. Oh, that's that like grease we used to put on. <laughs> but it, it's, oh. all, it's all about responsibility. It's, it's all about responsibility. Black and white, brown and yellow. It's all our responsibility. Right. Tell the real history right. of this country. And uh, you know, this one I love. Uh, you all have one of these uh, old frying pans yeah. at home? I mean, you can't say it. I mean, yes, the good one. Yes, that's what you say <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, that's worried up in the heartbeat. You try to burn them off. I wrote about that. Got a whole set. And the house I moved in, I was out there in the garage, they had a place where you could push up. I pushed up and stuck my hand in there. Whole set. They left the hands. And uh, so those are the things that uh, I said I talked about in this particular book, and each has a, each one's going to be different. And I, if, if I can, because I used to cry with this. Lately, I've been talking about washwomen. Uh, I've done a lot of posting on Facebook. Actually, they were the ones responsible for uh, civil disobedience to research our history. It wasn't those kids sitting down at the counter. They didn't start anything new. They just came along at the right time. Okay, But these women, way back in our history, we talk about it for years, you know. Well, white women didn't like to do laundry. I'm talking about people that had something. You know, they didn't want to work. That was beyond it. So these black women, wash women, did the laundry. And uh, they wanted to charge more. They said, oh, no. Uh, this happened in Atlanta, this particular event. And uh, so, the city said, we're going to get even with you. Every day we're going to charge you $25. That was more than they were taking in on the laundry. Okay. So, but they didn't give up. All of a sudden, them speaking out and doing things, more and more organizations popped up. Everybody's challenging. Uh, I may not be able to get through this. My grandmother, my great-great-grandmother, lived to be 110, according to the Enterprise. She was actually 114. Anna Leach, she was a washwoman. Edith, what's the name of the guy that died? You used to call him the honorary mayor, High Point, remember? Uh, he was into everything. Uh, well, anyway, 
uh, he, uh, my grandmother lived down there by herself. Trinity College was down there, and she was doing laundry for the students. She was, she was constantly raped by these men. She was an uneducated black lady. Some of them resulted in family, my family. Okay. Uh, one of the people involved was the son of one of the most prominent people in high school. This person documented this up to your unofficial mayor high point. He asked me one day, he said, you know anything about your grandmother down there? He told me. I said, and it matched everything. This person became, I mean, very prominent in politics and everything else. That was my grandfather's father. He used to come down to the house on Monday, he didn't know anything about it. And my grandfather never even discussed it. And um, but he would say I came to visit my brother. And they would sit on the front porch and talk. But my mother said he never would talk about it. So I know pain. It's the first time I got through it really without a tear. Just to know that how she was abused and used probably for 25 cents. So, but did I write about that? No. I didn't write about that. I talk about it every now and then. When I, but I got through it today. But it's, it's always there. And, um, my most popular story, it hasn't been printed yet, it's probably going to be, it's going to be the one about my son, my oldest son, Paul, he lived over in Pawtown, had a farm over there in Pawtown. He loved to farm and stuff, he had peacocks, I mean he had all sorts of birds and um, doing very well. He had a couple nursing homes, uh, rehab facilities for drugs and stuff. One night, my phone rang at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's my son. He said, Daddy, my house is burned to the ground. About 6,000 feet of house burned to the ground. There was my son reaching out to me, and I didn't know what to do. And I think I just posted on Facebook. I think I just posted on Facebook yesterday. Uh, it it was so divisive, you know, with what they went through. You know, I mean, everything you ever owned and all the animals, the parrots, the uh, pe well, peacocks running crazy out there. You know, I think it took them 15 years to catch up with them. Uh, but um, pygmy goats, that's what started the fire. You know, a litter of pygmy goats, and they were like worth five thousand dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. And they put on a uh, heat lamp. Mm -hmm. They had all the stuff downstairs in the basement for these animals, the wash stations on. And the thing, something happened to, and uh, it burned. And uh, but luckily, they all got out. But um, yeah, that's, that's going to be one because. That one was uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, so a lot of times I wake up in a cold sweat. And uh, my youngest son came in there the other night at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I, and I just relived the whole thing again. You know, just, uh, okay, so any other questions? I, I love to talk. <laughs> if, if I got paid for every minute that I talk, I'd be rich. But I want to thank the society for having me. And uh, 
But if you want me to uh, come out and talk at a church or other places, uh, I'd be glad to come out. Uh, one thing, I may, pro I may set something up with you, but that something may come up. I'm a caregiver for my wife, and I never, like this morning, she had an emergency, and I didn't think I was going to make it, but I was able to. And, uh, but that's what I tell, you know, I never know. And uh, like I was told about some new dinners. If you don't make your appointments $50, I say, I won't be coming back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen, but if you know, I can be on my way out here. I can tell you 24 hours how my wife's going to be feeling. I don't even know when I go in the room in the morning. So, but that's something else that, um, oh, this story here. Uh, the 1963 YMCA All-American Basketball Team. And guess who's on this picture? Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> Came to High Point. Played down the wide, played the national championship. There he was. And my daddy's club put them up. You didn't have a place. They couldn't stay in hotels. So they put them up in rooms. And my mother brought this tall man we didn't know who he was. I don't know who he was looking down <laughs> to meet us. And uh, little did I know that later on he was uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Yeah, right here in High Point. That place was sold out that night. Uh, and that YMCA, he played for a boy. They put a hurt on High Point. Uh, I still tease uh, where the most of them are head now. But, uh, you know, we had uh, a Jew town. You remember just on the other side of Washington Street? On the 100 block on the other side of Main Street? Yeah, yeah, the Jewish still was over there? I can't think. The name went off. Yeah, we called you that. Man, let me stand out there on Friday. They knew when you got paid. If you bought a pair of pants in there for a dollar, 10 years later you'd be paying on. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Come on, just give me a five cent. Come on, come on. <laughs> and they never kept a record on anything, you know. Yeah, okay, but yeah, uh, Roseburg, Jake Harrison. Oh, well, Jake Harrison was on that. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Don't worry about something the wife. Um. I, I would cut this off, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I put it on like what I call was vibrate, and evidently it didn't work. So. Your grandsons would know how. Uh, Your grandchildren would know how. That little boy, man. Ooh, grandson, man. Whew. These kids learn fast now. And anybody dealt with that new man? Well, you have been. I don't have a clue what they're talking about. I'm, Daddy, Daddy, this thing has done, 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 done. Man, look, go in there and talk to your grandmother, you know. But that's some hard thing. And it comes out the same way. But I don't understand why we got to go to Greensboro and come back before we go with the answer. Okay, folks, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much.